Okay, it's nine o'clock. Ah, hello. Ah, 各位大家好，我是专心理杂志的总编辑啊 ，Roger 老师。哈啊，很开心帮各位邀请到这位全世界最有影响力的呃这个呃敏捷大师啊，就是啊我们 Mike 先生啊。那今天啊，这场啊国际级的一个专访啊，我们特地邀请到两位啊这个口译专家来帮啊 Michael 大师来去做啊这个现场的一个啊啊专门口译哈、啊。那各位在下面会有一个地球，你把它点下去啊，那选择简体中文，你就可以听到啊这个呃、啊、口译人员的啊即时翻译。那如果各位要听中文，你就把它啊关闭就好，你就可以听到啊麦克啊这个呃、啊、大师的一个现场分享。那在这个口译呢，我们非常感谢啊 We Interpreters com 的两位老师 Zoe 老师跟树老师的协助。OK， 好，那我们就开始今天的一个专访吧。Hi， 啊、uh, ，I'm Roger。啊 ，With me, Angel is a representative of translation volunteers. Today, ah,、uh, we are happy to have the most Influential agile people in the world, the Mr. Mike Kong. <laughs> I don't know if that's true, but I'm glad to be here. So, Mike, uh, uh, thank you for your time for accepting our invitation today. As you know, we gather a group of enthusiastic volunteers to translate your masterpiece. Ah,、uh, <laughs> and、uh, the user story applied. Uh, the volunteers include the product managers, scrum master, project manager from IT, traditional industry, construction, and R&D. This is our honor to have an interview with you.、Uh, before starting today's interview, could you say hello to potential readers and your fans in Taiwan?、Mm -hmm. Also, could you tell us a little about yourself for those who just discover your work? I, I can, but I. So first off, yes, hi everybody.、Um, I'm worried I've been oversold.、Uh, most influential masterpiece. I don't.、Uh, I don't think I've ever had those terms applied to me. But thank, thank you, Roger, and I appreciate everybody、uh, being here, and especially the effort of the、uh, the translators.、Uh, as an author, it's always an honor to have our our books spread more more widely.、Um, I got lucky and became an agile author because I'd been originally a, a programming author. I was a Author of some、uh, books on C plus plus and Java, and、uh, had been always been a manager, but I still wrote on those topics. And when、uh, Agile came around, I got lucky and was one of the first people into Agile. Started doing it in ninety five. So when、uh, when it became more popular, I was able to talk my、uh, publisher into a book、uh, early on, and have been very fortunate with that. Yes, now the four hundred fifty four people are online.、Huh? Then、uh, we know that、uh, Mr. Kong is one of the founders of Scrum Alliance. The mass media even named you as the most influential agile people in the world. You are guiding companies to apply Scrum to achieve the business success. Could you tell us about、uh, how you get started with the agile and Scrum? Yeah, I got started.、Um, I'll give you the honest story. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've got the little bit, the little bit honest, and then the fully honest story. I'll give you the fully honest story.、Um, in、um, October 1994, I was looking for a process that would work for me. I had been doing very traditional project management again, late 1994. It worked well, always successful on our projects up until then. You know, moderately successful, but projects were getting bigger for me. I was getting assigned to bigger projects, and they weren't working as well. And so I needed to find a process that was going to let me、um, scale up what we were doing. It wasn't going to be reliant on me keeping everything in my head as a kind of a lead programmer and manager. I needed something that would grow and more empower the teams. And so I found、um, a book from 1990 that mentioned Scrum.、Uh, got interested in that. It wasn't really written about in in books. Nothing existed beyond just like that one little. Like three pages in a book, and I started using Scrum to manage that project back then. Now that's kind of the that's kind of the nice version of the story. Here's the part where I said the totally true part of the story. I really had two criteria for the for the process that we would use. One that would help us do bigger projects. I couldn't do five hundred thousand, two thousand line Gantt charts on software anymore. It wasn't going to work. It was I was really reaching the limit of what I could force by just、uh, good management skills. 
and I needed a better process. That was from, but here's the part I don't always share. Um, I was a little bit selfish. I needed a process that would also let me program some. I needed a lightweight process because I wasn't really ready to give up being completely a programmer. And the nerd uh, geek programmer in me wanted something lightweight. And that worked out really well because it's what helped lead me to Scrum and helped me to understand the, the benefit of empowering teams and having them make decisions instead of, instead of me always having to to, to make those decisions. So that was how I got started. When um, the opportunity came around, I, I wanted to write a book about user stories because in Kent Beck's book, Kent Beck is the originator of the extreme programming process, which kind of came out of Scrum, kind of an offshoot of Scrum. He had uh, about two pages in there about user stories. And he said, it's tempting to write a book about user stories, but it can't be done. And he said, there's not enough there. And he wrote this in his book. And I'm like, wow, I'm not experiencing that because as I'm introducing this to companies, I've already got about a 40 page PDF of advice I've written. And so I took my, my PDF and pitched that to my publisher and said, can I, can I write the book? And they let me do that book in uh, 2004. And I know it got translated in 2010 into um, to simplified Chinese, but Roger, I'm curious why now, why the, so many years later, why are you doing or leading a translation in tradi into traditional Chinese? Yes. Uh, uh, translating this book is one of the contribution I would uh, like to do for the Taiwan Agile community. In China, uh, this book was translated into simplified Chinese in 2010, uh, 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. But Taiwan just only completed the traditional uh, Chinese version after 11 years, uh, now <laughs> uh, 2021. I hope that through the assistance of the Scrum volunteers, we can translate into traditional Chinese in a very short time and serve mm -hmm. as a bit best gift for the Taiwan Agile community. I believe it will speed up the, stay, uh, the pace of the Taiwan Agile. Uh, mm. I hope Taiwan uh, readers uh, can learn more about the concept of user story through this book. Uh, uh, and because I am a Scrum trainer, uh, to promote Scrum is my destiny and curse. Uh, with great power and comes the great responsibility. And I am and I'm promoting the Agile uh, in Taiwan for more than five years. Uh, in February this year, Scrum Alliance has approved our application. For the first time, uh, we, uh, we can host a regional Scrum gathering, the RSG uh, in Taiwan. This is the first time Taiwan uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, makes this ceremony. Uh, so the host organization consists of two major uh, Taiwan community. One is the Agile Community Taiwan, and the second is uh, our community, Taiwan Agile Tribe. We call it TAT. And mm -hmm. I am one of the core organizer of ISG Taipei. Uh, and the Taiwan first major international Agile forum was scheduled to be held on November 4, 5, and 6. Uh, we estimate uh, that uh, there will be more than 500 people who attend this gathering. Wow. wow. Yes. And nice. uh, it's my turn now. Uh, so uh, could you explain uh, about user story to us? Uh, many, uh, maybe uh, uh, the, the audience is not uh, familiar with this. Uh, and what kind of tool is this? How could we apply it in different sides of the project? And uh, many of uh, the audience ask, could it be applied in non-IT industries? Ooh, great question. I want to I, I want to remember the the non IT for a second and start with what it is. User stories. Let's talk about how they got started. They got started at a car manufacturing company here in the U.S. Um, company's called Chrysler, but car manufacturer, and they were writing their payroll system. Like, how do people get paid? And you know, some people it's easy. They get paid salary. Others get by the hour. Um, others get by the hour, but they get overtime. And if they work a holiday, they get more overtime. So a lot of complications in the payroll system. And they were writing this, uh, this new payroll calculation product. And the team was asked to speak to their customers in terms of saying, hey, tell me a story. How will you use this system? And so the team would go and talk to the accountants, for example, and say, hey, payroll accountant, 
how do you use this system? How would you use this system? Tell me a story. And so it came out of the idea of um, understanding the stories that somebody uses. And I think if we were to look at, you know, think about all your users, make it small, so there's not a lot of users, not a lot of things to do, but you interview all your users, maybe you get like 10 stories. And those 10 stories, they overlap. They, some of them do the same thing, but uh, they'd be things like, well, in the morning, the first thing I like to do is to see what happened last night. I look at that, I enter that into the system, I do whatever. So it came out of this idea of tell me a story of how you use the system. And uh, that is the origin. And it's really important to keep that in mind that the goal with the story is to understand a use of a user. How are they gonna use the system? What will they do? tell me a story is really important. Well, it's really easy. We get, you know, to, to say, tell me a story, but then we'll, what do we do with it? Right? How do we document it? And so a lot of the effort on stories over the last 20 or so years, since they were first popularized is to figure out how do we write about them? How do we communicate them? How do we group them? How do we split them apart? So, you know, somebody tells me a story, how do I split it into smaller stories so that I can actually act on those? What is too big? of a story, what's too small of a story. So um, absolutely, um, that's that's their origin. And in terms of like the non-IT use, definitely, definitely. Um, I'll give you two examples. I'm gonna give you three examples, a bonus example today, three examples. One is a summer camp that I worked with, like the little kids summer camp. And the kids will go there and I don't know, they play in the water or they swim or they can, canoe or they shoot bows and arrows and they they hike they do all this during the summer and the summer camp used scrum used user stories to renovate itself between years so the, i think the summer i'm making this the detail up here but i think the summer camp is probably open like four months a year three months a year during the other eight months they have to do all sorts of maintenance on the on the camp replace some uh, cabins clean out trails repaint the buildings, whatever they do. So they had stories about the work they had to do during the off season. They also had stories about what they had to do to prepare each week as a new set of uh, kids would come to the summer camp. So they use user stories for that. Um, a second example is uh, my daughter is getting married and I turned her onto a website I love called scrumyourwedding.com. And scrumming your wedding is absolutely a perfect project for Agile because Agile is good when we have a lot of, when it's a new project, nobody gets married that often that, you know, that getting married is, oh, I've done that a million times. And so it's always novel. It's always new. And where there's a lot of kind of moving parts, a lot of intersecting complexities. So, and the uh, Scrum Your Wedding recommends user stories as product backlog items. So um, we can we can use it there. I said I'd give a third one more, just brief example, is I was thinking about this a while back. I, about 21 years ago, had a decision to make, and the decision was three different things. I had an opportunity to go work at Amazon, be an employee at Amazon in 2000, and it would have been a nice job. Um, would have required me to move to a different city, um, and I didn't know how much Agile I'd be able to do, or I could... Um, pursue my current company, which is my company, all about agile training, coaching software. Um, or there was another small company in Denver where I was living at the time, Denver, Colorado in the US that wanted to hire me as their VP of engineering. And so I looked at those three opportunities I was having a hard time trying to decide you know, all their strengths or worst weaknesses. What I did is I actually wrote user stories about those different career opportunities. So um, all I did was kind of envision what my future would be like and I used a fairly standard story template, you know, as a, this, I'll do this. And so I wrote down things like as a VP at Amazon, I'll do this. As a VP at Amazon, I'll probably get paid pretty well. Um, as a VP at Amazon, I'll probably work more hours than I want. Um, as a VP at Amazon, I'll have to commute and commuting in their cities, kind of time consuming. So I just made these, uh, these little descriptions of the jobs and in the process of doing that, was totally obvious which job I should go do. So that's an example where I just used um, stories in life to, to make a decision. I wrote stories about how something would work out and use that to make the decision. So I think they apply way beyond just software projects. Wow, that's great. It seems a very good tool for everyone to use, uh, even not in uh, IT industry. Uh, and, it's a way of uh, thinking. Yes. 
And uh, if there is an agile learner uh, which wish to become an expert of user story, what is your suggestion to him to deepen learning and application? <laughs> is there any tool you would recommend uh, that could have synergy for uh, user story? For example, uh, in COVID-19 today, uh, we always use uh, Miro or Miro, uh, the online tool. Uh, uh, does, uh, is there any uh, collaboration tools for user stories? There are a number of tools. Um, Miro and Mural that you just mentioned are both really good. Um, they are not user story tools. They're basically cards on a wall tools. So they're not aware that you're typing in user stories. They're, you're, you're just typing something and moving it around. You can very well do it for user stories. Works great for stories, but it's, all I mean is that it's not story aware. Um, like, I don't know, I track my mortgage payments, my house payments in Excel. Excel is not mortgage aware. Just I, It's just got two columns and numbers, right? And so Mural and Miro, there's a lot of others. There's one called Stormboard, like bad weather out there. There's a storm, Stormboard. Uh, one I like, Concept Board, uh, Lucid. Uh, Lucid Charts has one for doing this. I think it's called Spark now. Um, there's one other um, in that category. Um, oh, Whimsical. Uh, is in that category. There's a couple others that are story aware. Uh, the ones that are story aware would be featuremap.co, um, avion, avion.io, um, cardboardit, cardboardit.co, I think. Um, so there's a few that are story aware. Those are a little bit more around the idea of creating what's called a story map, which is an innovation Jeff Patton brought to the user story world which instead of just, as we think about user stories, we normally think of it as just a stack, high priority, low priority. Jeff said, think about it as a stack of priorities, but also think about it in a second dimension, the sequence. I log in, I do something, I log out. And so that'd be a story map where we have two dimensions across and down. And so some of the tools that I just mentioned, feature map, Avion, Cardboard It, um, Stories on board is another one. Those are all story aware. So they do know you're doing user stories. It gives them a little bit more power. They're not necessarily as polished. I think Mural and Miro, the two you mentioned, are the most polished. So any of those work, but also so does just typing them into a, uh, a, a document, Google Doc, Word document, anything like that. So I do quite a bit with, with that just to get organized, to get my thoughts organized before I start thinking about putting them into cards. Those tools are a little bit clunky for just fast editing. Okay. So, oh, oh, sorry, I have a question. So, Mike, what do you say is that uh, the user story could be as any format, uh, use any software, and also uh, could could be like depends on the uh, the industry. Uh, I could transform into different kind of format to tell the story and uh, to not only to let the uh, the developer know, but to from the like a business side that they could understand it by the mm -hmm. just by the script. Is that right? Yeah, I, I think the idea with this here's what's nice with with user stories. I, I've read these various articles or books that talk about how like let's talk about making a movie, and there's you know there's something like there's only nine stories in the world, and they just all get told the same way, right? And I had a film class many many years ago, and it was. Um, taught by a really good professor who's a famous movie critic. One of the films he had us watch was Saturday Night Fever. I don't know if you've seen that one or remember that one. So the one where John Travolta's disco dancing, right? And um, we watched that and he mapped it to basically the traditional hero's journey. And so we were thinking about things like, um, you know, the ancient Greek dramas like uh, the Odyssey, where you know, Odysseus has, you know, he has to escape from seven trials and goes and back to his homeland. And we're mapping that basically to something like uh, Saturday Night Fever, the disco dancing movie. And it totally matches. Right? I mean, the story is exactly the same at the, the plot levels. And so there's not that many stories. If we look at what's going on, there's not that many, there's not that many ways to tell a story. There's not that many ways to write a story. And the same thing kind of applies when we do product development, software development, or planning a wedding or thinking about my life, that there's not that many ways. And so what that's led to is people creating templates for how we write a story. And I think this is partially what you're getting after. One of the templates for writing a story uh, talks about who 
needs the thing, what do they need and why do they need the thing? So if you think about writing a story, it's going to say who, what, and why. And it's like, so um, I don't know, I'm looking at Zoom right now. And so who needs something, right? A Zoom administrator needs something. Um, what do they need? They need a mute everybody button, right? Um, why? Because they don't know who's making the loud noise, but somebody's got a really loud noise going and it's affecting the call. And the, the Zoom admin just wants to mute everybody except himself um, or admins, let's say. And so that's going to lead us to writing a user story that says, as a Zoom admin, I want a mute everybody button so that uh, I can mute anybody making really loud noises. And one of the reasons why I like to have that, that last part so that, because that gets at the person's underlying reason and their underlying reason may be, um, may lead us to a different idea. And so I'm thinking about Roger having to hit a mute all button right now. Well, what instead if Zoom decided to add a feature that like, look, anytime somebody is making a constant noise above a certain threshold, we automatically mute them. I'm thinking about like when my neighbor decides to mow my mow his lawn. My neighbor's lawn is like literally right outside my window. If he mows, like we're probably safe this, this early. But if he mows his lawn, it's just a really loud noise for 20 minutes, right? I'm obviously not talking and making a, a loud drone for 20 minutes. Zoom could automatically mute me. And I think it does have some, some features like that. But so that would be a story. And that would be told from the who, what, and why. Other times we have stories where a different template applies, right? Remember I said we have you know, seven story archetypes in the world. They're not all the same. There's a couple of different types of story. Well, we have the same thing. In our world, we have another technique called a job story. And in a job story, it's more the job is more important than who. And so there we look at what is the job to be done? And we think about what we think about when something needs to be done, what it is and why. So the when replaces the who. An example of a job story would be something like, when I'm logging in, I want to see a password reminder so that I don't have to create a new account. I can reuse my old account with, with just a new password. And so when I'm logging in, that doesn't apply to the Zoom admin only. That applies to any Zoom user. And so sometimes it's more important to talk about when something occurs than who does it. And so we've got a couple of different templates like that that make telling the story um, more easily, more easy. Capturing the story becomes more easy. And so I don't know if I answered the right part of that question, but that sounded like what was part of where you were thinking. Yes, so. thank you. Good, good. Okay, uh, and the first print, uh, first print of the user story applied uh, was in March uh, 2004. Uh, and uh, do you know how many uh, prints, uh, copies has been sold in the world? Uh, and what's the difference uh, after 70 years about the user story? Uh, I think there is uh, something evolution on uh, this too. Uh, how would you suggest the readers making up the difference after reading this book? Yeah, really interesting, Roger. So stories have been around a long time. And you know what? I might have written the book about six months early. Um, so I was definitely like leading edge in terms of writing that book. And when it came out, I wrote it very quickly because like I said I'd already had 40 pages as a PDF. So a lot has changed in user stories since then. One of the things that changed is the emphasis on templates. Um, right after my book came out, everybody started putting stories in the first of the templates I described um, as a name, the type of user, as a Zoom admin, I want, what do you want? And then say why. So as a type of user, I want, so that that became very popular. Um, and if you go back and read through my book, um, I don't think I have any examples, not a single one in that template. I mentioned the template. I say it's a good idea. I say I use it sometimes, but I'm not obsessed with it. I don't write all my stories that way. And part of it was the book coming out. And I remember right as the book was getting ready to come out, I saw early readers starting to adopt that template for everything. And, and I thought, Oh, should I told my publisher one more month, just hold off a month. I want to change all the examples to use that template. And I decided no, because I didn't want to overemphasize the template. But what came out was people loved that template and started to really write stories that way. And somewhat to the exclusion of where they'd look at it and go, oh, that's not a story. It doesn't start with as a user. It's not a story. It's like, yes, it is. It might be a different type of story. The user is still 
told us a story about how they would use the system. So one of the big things is a uh, much greater reliance on templates. And I'm on board with that. I like templates. I use templates. I think it's a good thing. But I personally, I don't think we should be in a world where we say, oh, that's not a story. Um, it doesn't follow the template, right? It might be a story just in a different format or a template wasn't needed for this story or this story was so unique that it didn't make sense to force it into a template. And so one of the things has been uh, an addition of a couple templates um, and an emphasis on templates. Story mapping is a completely brand new topic. And that was what I mentioned where um, Jeff Patton has the idea of uh, prioritizing down a list but also setting things across in a sequence. And so those are two of the big concepts. A third would be um, a lot more emphasis on adding detail to a story by adding what we can go ahead and call its acceptance tests, right? What are the acceptance tests for this story? And if we understand those, then we understand when the story is complete. And so one of the things I've written about since then has been this idea that you can break a story down. Stories can be big, right? Uh, give me this, give me this whole system. Do payroll for my whole company be a big story? Well, I can break that down. One way to break it down is by splitting it into smaller stories. The other way is to get to fairly small stories and don't break them down smaller, but add detail to them and say this story is done when it passes this test, this test, this test. So something about a login story, I might want to say, I've got a good login story when when users can log in when they enter the right password, they're let in. Wrong password, they're not let in. And when they can create a password reminder, they're locked out after three failed attempts and the password has to be strong. It has to be eight characters, one symbol, one number, something like that. So um, I think those would be the, the biggest things that, um, that have changed in that, in that period. Um, I'm curious though, Angel, as one of the, uh, as one of the translators, what, what motivated you to, to be a volunteer? I mean, that's, you know, I'm honored that, that there'd be a group of volunteers to translate the book. What motivated you to be a translator? And in translating, did you find it helpful? Did you find it out of date? Um, or were some of the ideas still useful today, 17 years later? For me, uh, after I got a certification of the product owners and the Scrum mm -hmm. Masters, I still have a lot of questions like how to write a better sto user stories and how could I start with the, the project that I'm working with to, to write a story to let uh, my developer or uh, the client know uh, or the, how, how it works. So um, I even thinking about whether the way I'm writing the user story is right or wrong. Uh, your book is really helpful that you understand how the concept of the user story and how to start it to help me to know what is the user story the purpose for and how it could be helped with. So yeah, okay. yeah, it's a good, <laughs> did I answer good. your question? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I appreciate you volunteering that. Uh, how long did, how long, how many hours or do you have any idea how long you spent on it? Is it quite a bit of time? Well, it's a lot. <laughs> what? Yeah, we spent a lot of time trying to uh, back and forth that because uh, the English words is different with the Chinese, uh, traditional Chinese wording. So we try to figure out what is the purpose word for that. And, uh, and through the, your book, I could understand uh, part of uh, your meanings and part of it we need to transfer into traditional Chinese to, to make it more close to the local people or the people who use the traditional Chinese. So it's like people is arguing, okay, which word is the better one? And what is the word? We, we even like have a doubt our, ourselves, like it's the right Chinese word that we use in the daily. I would imagine that's hard. I've always wanted to be good enough at a second language that I could read a book in its original language never a technical book my brain couldn't do that but you know could I read some of my favorite novels a couple of my novels my favorite novels are French could I read a, a old favorite novel in French or something mm -hmm. I I'm not really trying I just always wish I could so you know, nice to nice to do nice to have that skill yeah thank you uh but I also have a question so after we read your book I wonder what is the the next step for the uh for the user stories or uh, did you have more information that you could uh, help us 
if we want to practice or to know more about the how could we practice the user story and what is the uh, it will help us uh, to understand more. Yeah, because it is an ongoing thing. Stories are a, stories are a complicated topic. One of the things I've learned over the years is that I'm going to talk about estimating just for a second. Estimating is a really hard skill to learn, but if I can get people to a certain point where they they get one thing, they're like, "Aha, I get it. I understand estimating," and they're done. They don't need they don't need to go read any more estimating books. Like they're literally done. There's nothing more to read. They get it. Um, user stories are a thing where even if you're really good, you can always get better. And I somewhat equate that to I don't know any sport. I mean, I you know I play basketball. I can go out there and practice shooting all day long. I'm a, I'm a golfer. I can practice shooting. Always get my stroke better. Or swimmer. I think about swimmer and they're you know trying to get their stroke, get their hand in the perfect place in the water. And so user stories feel like something I can always learn more about. And so a handful of years ago, a couple of years ago, I created a course, a video course called BetterUserStories.com. I'm gonna put that into the chat, betterusersstories.com. And it it's a full course, like six hours of extra stuff. And it's all stuff that would be useful after reading that book. Um, but there's also a free version on that site. There's about an hour of free videos on that website. So um, if you go there, there's an hour of a little bit more advanced topics. And they're on things like story map that I mentioned, the idea of two dimensions. They're on um, how to split a user story, how to know in enough, too much detail in a story, things like that. So I would say that's a really good resource. Also, just um, my blog has a bunch of articles. I've been writing about stories for 17 years there. And there's also a really good book by Jeff Patton, who I mentioned, who did the map. And mm -hmm. so let me type his name in here. Um, Jeff Patton. Um, I take a look at his book. If you're uh, heavily interested in the mapping idea, we have that in that video course. Watch the free videos first. Don't spend money, watch their free videos. Um, and then uh, either go with my course, check out his book, depending on what you're interested in, but I um, highly recommend his book for story mapping. Also, uh, that's a good source. Like, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. uh, but I also noticed that um, on your website that you have some online training in the video. Also, you have your own YouTube channel. Could you tell us more a little bit about it or, and the, um, if we want to find something about the user stories, is there any information and how could we start with it? Um, there are movies, uh, videos on YouTube. I don't remember which ones are there. I'm not real good at, you know, you can call it a channel, but it's kind of a, a place I put things when it's like, oh, I haven't put anything on YouTube for a while. Um, I'm uh, very ambitious about, it. I try to come out with two blogs a month and every week, I send on every Thursday, I send a really short, it's about 500 words, just really short email with a tip about Agile. And I do those all the time. YouTube is like, oh, we haven't put anything on YouTube for a while. Let's put something on YouTube. And so I'll often put on YouTube uh, a video or two from one of our courses. So there should be some videos on YouTube as well um, from the Better User Stories course. We'll take you know two or three or five videos and put them out there and say, hey, here's a sample from a course. Um, and so those there, but I don't have a lot of really long videos on YouTube, except for some, uh, conference recordings. Um, a couple of the conferences that I was at years ago, did a really good job of recording everything. So there is like an hour long, uh, introduction to, to user stories, um, mm -hmm. on YouTube as well. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah. so I, I just wonder, uh, if there are anything else that you want to let us know, if we want to know more about the user story on, and the, how to get the patterns? I think the biggest thing would be to go to um, my betterusersstories.com website or my blog is at mountaingoatsoftware.com. Um, those will lead you out to anything that I've created. So if it's a YouTube video, it'll also be on our site. Those will lead you out to anything that I have to say. So, you know, look at the, uh, look at the blogs, look at the, the free videos there. And then if you're really uh, really like stories when I get really good at it, the, the, vid the full video course, six hours, um, plus a lot of worksheets and things like that it goes into that a lot deeper. So those would be the resources I'd point people towards. Cool. So uh, I just wonder, because we have some, some of the people uh, volunteering, and also we have a lot of like, wow, it's almost 600 attended. <laughs> uh, so I just wonder whether they have questions to want to ask you as well. So uh, at the meantime, probably uh, we could 
ask few questions that when we were waiting for the question that they are asking for. Yeah, so, the more questions, the better. So, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, one of the people like uh, wants to know that what is the most common mistake while applied to user stories? Um, the biggest mistake is people getting obsessed with those templates. Um, and, uh, oh, that can't be a story. It doesn't start with who, or um, that's, uh, that's the biggest that I see. The other big, I'm actually going to give you two. Um, the other big mistake is people feeling like they need every last detail in a story. And keep in mind, this is why I said this at the very beginning, that a story is about a conversation. Like you go to somebody, a user and say, tell me how you use the system. And imagine you have that conversation. User stories don't exist. This concept doesn't exist. But you're just talking to a user and they say, here's how I use this system. You're going to come back later with questions. You can't ask them everything. You can't remember everything. You can't write down everything. So you're going to have to have additional conversations. And so I like to think of a story as a promise to have that conversation. And I want to write down enough that I can have the later conversation. Um, but I don't need to get every last detail out of it. Um, as an example, I think what we did in preparation for this was um, was a really useful concept where, you know, we came up with a, a couple of like, well, you did, you know, you asked me some questions that you knew would be on people's mind. And now we're opening it up for others to have questions. And so you do a little bit of work up front, document a few things about the story that lets you go back to your, whoever's telling you the story and say, Hey, uh, three weeks ago or three years ago, we talked about this. You said you needed to do this with the system. We're ready to work on it. Tell me more. And so we need that tell me more part. And the big mistake people make is often feeling like I can write down everything. I can just right now, I'm talking to my user, I'm gonna write everything down that they need. That's never gonna happen. So it's just not gonna happen. Okay, uh, it's from the uh, Godfrey that, and some of the people ask the almost similar question. They just want to know how to use or how to apply user story for the organization agile. That's a good question, Garfield. I am not sure with that how obsessed I want to be with a template, kind of going back to my first answer. Mm -hmm. um, what I want to do there is, right, basically what I want to do is just create a product backlog of, uh, of what it means to be organizationally agile. And so for that, I'm going to look at like, where do we have groups that are that are not agile groups that are slowing us down. And I might write a few things. I'm thinking of like, you know, an executive group doing this or being guided by a coach, like, okay, what do we need human resources or personnel department to do better? And maybe they need to be faster at hiring people. They're, you know, they take way too long before they give us resumes, not very agile. Or maybe we have a bad human resources policy in terms of annual reviews. Um, they're too person oriented instead of team oriented. I want some of that stuff changed to be a truly agile organization. So I need backlog items for those things. They're just examples, but I need backlog items, whether those are written as like, you know, as an employee, I want to be evaluated more as a team member than as a, my, my personal contribution. It sounded like a pretty good story. So maybe there's some benefit there, but I'm not, I'm not going to be obsessed with a template. I'm more going to be interested in getting down what I, what I need to do there. Mm -hmm. um, the finance group, right? what do they need to do? They need to, you know, maybe uh, um, I was talking to somebody that somebody wanted to buy one of my, my courses and it's a $299 course. And she emailed a question to our, you know, support. I answered her back. Um, email back a day later. It's like, okay, my boss approved, but now I have to get my boss's boss approval. And he was like, oh my God, three people have to approve a $300 course. It's like, this can't be worth their time, right? It's like, this just says so many bad things about your company. And so, you know, if somebody can't buy a $300 course or, you know, with their boss's approval, that's the type of thing we want to fix. So I mean, my point would be to have a a backlog more than anything else. And whether they work as stories or not, I'm not 100% sure Garfield, but I would wanna have a backlog um, around things. I tend to think of those as like improvement backlogs or transition backlogs. And we try to make progress on them. We make a list of all the things we wanna improve at. And so it's not a product backlog, it's more of an improvement backlog. Okay. So uh, since you, uh, people are is asking about the HR, so uh, Rob, 
Roger just mentioned before that in this year we are going to have like RSG like um, in Taiwan. So I just wondered, did you attend any RSG before like in the US? And, uh, and could, uh, did you have any like, how do you feel it? Or how do you, do you have any suggestions to give us? Because it, it's our first time to go in to have it. I don't know if I have advice on how to put one on or how to make it successful, but um, I do know how to attend. I have organized them. I have helped organize the events. Um, the very first one was actually in my hometown and my wife and I organized it um, in Boulder, Colorado. And, and so we did two or three there. Um, it was kind of our, one of where the Scrum Alliance got started. So we did the first, uh, I think like the first and third gatherings were there. Um, I just remember going to the first two, going to the first two. And because they were in my town, going home that night, talked to my wife and being so energized. I was so pumped up about all the people doing Scrum, all the progress that we were making in the world and just being very energized by the thing. I am sure I learned stuff, but I don't remember what I learned. I do remember leaving energized. And that's often something that um, I have felt with conferences is I'll go to conferences and I don't mean this in an egotistical way, but I've I've been around a long time. So when I go to a conference, I don't learn 50 new things. I look for like two or three things that are awesome. And if I learn two or three things, that is that is way paid back being at the conference. But I always feel like I go through the kind of the course of the year and my energy starts to drain, 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 drain. Then there's a big conference like that. And it's like I go and I meet everybody doing it and I get excited again. And all of a sudden my energy is back full, right? I'm back at peak level. And then it drains again, and I have to get at the next one six, nine, 12 months later. And so that to me is one of the big things is the attendee. So I don't know um, if you're asking for organizational advice, that'll be harder for me. So. So then, so, uh, Roger, did you, uh, you didn't open your mouth. Thank okay. You. Uh, I have a question uh, for uh, Mike. Um, uh, because uh, we, uh, we will take the first. Uh, uh, RSG in Taiwan for the first time, for very, very first time. And Congratulations. Uh, thank you. And there's a, a small uh, uh, YouTube uh, I, I shown to everybody. Nice. Uh, this is the first time that uh, we will uh, uh, we will uh, uh, take this uh, event in Taiwan. So, in your uh, point of view, uh, how can we make this uh, RSG uh, to be better or best uh, for a first timer? Do you have some uh, uh, recommendation? For example, uh, what kind of speaker we need to uh, invite? And uh, uh, what, uh, because it is three days uh, activities uh, and all are online because uh, of the COVID-19. Uh, so uh, for uh, Mr. Kong, do you have any recommendation uh, how to organize this uh, ISG? It will be happen at 11, uh, November 4, 5, and 6. Maybe, maybe a couple ideas. One of the things from successful events I've been involved in is where we did, and this tying it to user stories, where we had um, a list of user roles, who were our users. And so you have somebody who's new, but curious, like right? they've never done Scrum, but they're curious about it. Maybe you have somebody who's new that's done a little bit of Scrum, mid-level experience Scrum, then very experienced with Scrum and think about what they need, right? So basically write user stories for them, right? I'm going to need this. I'm going to need senior, uh, senior level talks so that I can hear, I can learn really advanced topics. Uh, but if you think about the experienced people, they don't learn as much just from sitting in an audience. So you might want to look at more experiential things for them, things where they can practice doing stuff. And I know a couple of things that have come out of this over the, the years. One of the most popular things we did at a conference was um, we had a few people who um, led tours back to their building, right? Their team would do maybe a daily stand-up at 9.30. Maybe they normally did a little bit earlier, but they'd put it off until 9.30. 
and somebody was at the conference and would walk people over to that building and let anybody who wanted stand in and listen to a daily scrum and then afterwards ask the team 15 minutes of questions. Um, the feedback we got from that was that was one of the highlights of the conference that and that was for the people who were completely new and just wanted to see how does this scrum thing work and to to go back and not talk to conference attendees who are always like excited right but just the normal employees are just back in the office working on it so if you have anybody any companies doing it nearby near the facility that you could walk to um have somebody come back and just you know walk them through to that um, I thought that was a, a really good part of, of doing it for indoctrinating the new people because they were not having to get intimidated. So I think it's we go with what we learned from stories, which is to think about our users. And then if we can't have users tell us stories, we have to ask ourselves for those stories. OK, what would this user want out of this event and why would they want that out of the event? So try it that way to see if you come up with some good advice. Wow, that's a great point. Wow. It's a good use of user story. <laughs> <laughs> they fit. They fit. They really do. So. Thank you. Uh, and we back to uh, audience uh, Q and A. Uh, and uh, almost uh, the most uh, frequent asked question is uh, the uh, how to train the PO to uh, to <laughs> uh, describe or use a uh, user story because uh, something uh, sometimes the PO is not familiar with the user story, and the scrum master need to teach him. Uh, so uh, do you have any idea to make the PO uh, more uh, smart uh, to learn the user story? Yeah, what I do is this, and this is where I like the templates quite a bit. This is where the templates really help. So I will typically schedule a meeting with my product owner or go into their office. Um, but I like to on some space on a wall on the whiteboard, and we could do this just on a screen in Zoom, but on space in a whiteboard, I will write as a, and I'll draw a line, I, I'll draw another line. Um, and then so that, and I'll draw another line. And I'll say, look, what we found is the best way to communicate to our, to our team, programmers, testers, designers, is to fill in that template. Let's talk about this. And then I'll start out by saying, okay, who are our users? Let's just brainstorm. I'm seriously, 15 minutes. Let's just talk for 10, 15 minutes, who uses our system? And let's go back to the conference example, right? How long would it take to think about who uses the conference, right? I mean, I listed off four or five different types of users. There might be a few more vendors, um, things like that, um, sponsors, hosts. Um, so we make a list of our users. And then I say, okay, let's start telling ourselves stories about what they wanna do um, to the system. If it's a brand new system, what are all their stories? If it's a, a add-on, a new feature, new thing we're adding, it's like, okay, what do they want to add to this system? Well, this type of user wants this, this type of user wants it to work quickly, right? So we just make a list of those things. And for me, the key is product owners are, are pretty trainable and user stories are not that hard, right? Just fill in this template. Um, the challenge is getting them early enough because often what might happen is the product owner might have written a system requirements document, the system shall this, the system shall that. And what I'd like to do is to get to them before they do that so that we can um, have them basically write that document, but do it in the form of user stories is going to be more helpful. So um, I'm mostly about trying to get earlier with the product owner. So I might do what I just described, but it's too late and we can do it for the new stories. But then I'll say, okay, next time you start a project, it'd be really fun to, to start this way. Let me know. I will block out time on my calendar. I will be there to help. That's the key word, right? Be there to help. Who doesn't want help? And so um, that way we can get earlier into the process. So write the template on the wall, tell the product owner you're there to fill it in and try to get earlier into the process. Okay. Uh, and another uh, common asked question. Uh, there are many roles in the user story, uh, but sometimes uh, the uh, PO just focus on the uh, uh, a little uh, a little role. For example, his boss is a uh, CEO, so yep. uh, he, uh, his user story role is as a CEO I want, as a CEO I want. But uh, most of the time, the user or, or the buyer is not the CEO. Uh, he is only <laughs> the boss of the company. So how to prevent this kind of uh, user story uh, fault? I, so first off, what, I think it's totally fine to have some, not a lot, but a little, to have some stories that are like that. Um, 
we, you know, Mountain Goat is my company, small company, 20 of us. Um, we have occasionally a story that's about me. In fact, I gave one to my, my, um, my CTO yesterday. The story I gave to my CTO is we are right now, we are doing courses like this. We do them on Zoom, the like a, a two-day course on Zoom. And it's and we're going to have to think about going back to in-person, which I'm looking forward to doing. So I'm like, you know, go into hotel, rent a hotel barroom, do a class there, kind of what I used to do until 15 months ago. And what I, the story I gave my CTO yesterday was basically as Mike, the CEO of the company, I want to start seeing a monthly report on how many people we train online versus how many people we train in person. Um, broken down by course. So that was a story I gave to him. That's not even used to anybody else in the company, maybe my sales or marketing people, but it was a story I wrote for me. We could fake that and write, as a customer, I want to see this data. As a customer, I want Mike to have this data, but it's something the boss wanted. And I think that's perfectly fine. So I think your real question is to make sure we don't have a lot of those things. And so what I do, the way I avoid having a lot of those is I apply what I call a 30 second rule. Anytime you see a story like that, spend 30 seconds. That's a lot of time. Spend 30 seconds and think about it. Could you get that story closer to a real user? And so if we had a story like mine, where as the CEO, I want to see this report, I'm like, no, the CEO really is the user. That's perfectly fine. But if we had another one, let's stick with Zoom. Um, as the Zoom product owner, we see a lot of stories that are like that as well. As the Zoom product owner, I want Zoom hosts to be able to put people into breakout rooms, right? Well, we can get closer to users. We don't have to have as the Zoom product owner, I want to be able to do this. Admins want to do this. So let's just get rid of that. And we'll rewrite the story as a Zoom admin, I can put people into breakout rooms. And so a lot of times we see stories written from the product owner perspective that we can just go one level down. Sometimes I feel like this is just somebody being nice and they just want to ask nicely. They just want to say, as the product owner, I want this thing. Can I have it? And they're trying to ask nicely. I want to think about it like, as the Zoom admin, I need to be able to do this. And it doesn't sound as nice, but it's the real need. So I think it's just making sure we don't do it too often. 30 second rule helps with that. Okay. Okay, and there's another uh, common ask question. Um, I can pick a couple uh, if you want while you look. Yes. Do you want me to pick a couple while you pick the next big one? Or do you have one? Uh, I have one, yeah. Okay. Okay. Is there any variation uh, in today uh, for COVID-19? Uh, uh, so the, uh, the, user, the use of the user story uh, is something different uh, with, uh, because uh, in before we, we can face to face and we can discuss the user story uh, with our client or with, yeah. or, or with PO, but in the COVID-19, uh, we can just only uh, at home, work at home. Uh, then. <laughs> Uh, is there uh, some any different uh, during the COVID-19 uh, after uh, uh, when use this uh, tool? I hadn't thought about that. That is a great question. I hadn't thought about that, but yes, there is. Um, and it's, 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 and it's because we're working from home. Anytime we have people in an office together, think about the stories I've told. You walk over to a user and say, tell me a story. Um, you go back, you sit at your desk, you have a question, you walk back over and talk to the user and say, hey, tell me more. That was the type of story I said that stories started with. Um, anytime we move stories away from that face-to-face -face communication, it's going to be okay, but we're going to have to write more, right? So if I think about how easy it is to... Um, to ask questions of somebody in your family, right? You see them every night. It's like, you just ask the question. Um, yet think of how hard it is to ask a question to me, um, just, you know, time zones and stuff like this. And so, Roger, I don't know, remember when we started setting this up, but two or three weeks ago, it took us two or three weeks to get a date and everything else to make this happen. And so it's harder to have the questions. And so when it's harder, you're going to have more documentation. You're going to have more thought go into those things. So when we shift to a work from home world, I would expect to see story, stories with more detail. I'd expect to see a few more acceptance criteria. I'd expect to see smaller stories um, just because of the burden of communication over Zoom as opposed to face-to-face. -to -face. So I think what we've seen has been going to smaller stories, 
and adding more acceptance criteria to those stories um, than we would have had to do in in a face to face world. Okay. Okay. Now uh, it's time uh, to uh, take the group photo. We are 556 person online. Huh? So can we take a, a photo with you? Maybe it will take uh, one minute because so many person. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I will invite everyone to open your webcam. Uh,大家可以把你的镜头把它打开来。我们让你跟这个麦控大师合照。那我们拍完照之后会把照片放在这个我们的敏捷部落里面请大家开镜头 OK Let's take a group picture Wow 500 people You got fast at that by the end so. Yes because uh, at the end uh, the, uh, there's uh, the webcam does not uh, open Yeah so, can, we, uh, can we do a few more questions from the chat? I'd love to answer if I can just do like five more questions I see and try to give some quick answers Yes, of we have time? course, you can choose any five questions. Yeah, okay. just a few that I see. So Lillian asked, confused about the purpose of the daily stand-up, whether it's to focus on what I've done, what I will do, and what's the problem. Lillian, great question, and I love a word you use in there, focus on those things. No, no, that's not the focus. The focus of the meeting is to synchronize our efforts, to make sure that you and I are headed in the same direction, right? That's the focus, a really good way to make sure we're going in the same direction, we're synchronized, is to ask, what did you work on and what are you gonna work on, right? So, but those aren't the focus. Those are the questions that help us get there. And I'd actually encourage you to experiment with those questions, maybe ask different ones. There's nothing magical about those questions. They are awesome questions, but keep in mind the goal is to synchronize the team, make sure we're headed in the same direction. I have a meeting uh, two hours from now with my team where we'll do that. And the goal is gonna to be to make sure we're working on the same thing, something changed, um, on one of my projects, I got to make sure everybody's aware of that. Um, it has to do, let me tell you what it was. It was a class we were going to do as videos, and now we're going to do it on Zoom. And so I got to make sure my video editor is not continuing to edit videos we're not going to use anymore because it's going to be live instead of recorded videos. And so it's about synchronizing effort. And so that would be the focus. Um, we had a question here about ad, can Agile um, in the mechanical industry? Um, absolutely. Um, one of my favorite clients is a company that makes um, insulin pumps for diabetics. And um, so they came to my class with their hardware engineer, their software engineer, and their mechanical engineer, their leads for those departments, and coordinated working together on there. Now, think about software. It's, it's soft, right? It's really easy to iterate prototype things in software. We get into mechanical engineering, hardware engineering, we're not going to be able to iterate as quickly. So it's going to take some more coordination among those groups, a little bit more planning ahead, but absolutely um, can be done. Um, there was another one here, which was similar. Oh, um, something on given when then, let's comment on that. I'll just like two more that I saw that I wanted to answer. Given when then is the syntax for stories. I love that syntax. Uh, comes from behavior driven development. Um, given this, when this happens, then this happens. Great way, but I like it for testers on down. Let's go back to my example. Where I want to go in my product owner's office and write as a, I, so that on their wall, say, hey, we're here to fill those in. That's easy. Given when then, that's complicated. It's like, that's such a hard sentence and it's got rules. It's going to be hard to get my product owner to talk that way. So I like given when then as something that the testers add to a story that's in a more natural language. Um, then we had a last one I wanted to deal with, Roger, unless you have one you want to, you want to get me with, which was about um, the pharmaceutical industry, um, regulated industries. Um, Agile in um, regulated industries does work. Here's the thing. If you're in a regulated industry, so are your competitors. And so your goal is not to be as agile as, as me or as agile as a game studio. It's to be as agile as your competitors and be 1% better. If you're 1% better, you're going to be faster. You're going to iterate through more ideas. There is a really good book coming out in about a month. Um, and she has got the longest name in the world. I'm typing it into the chat. Um, it's a book on agile in regulated industries. Um, and so I just typed that in Nancy Van Schuenderwort. Uh, she just goes by Nancy V because that's such a long name. And, but if you look for her, she's got a book coming out. Uh, should be next month. I just read the final proofs. I, got, I read the book in print or in, 
and while they were writing it and just gave them a little endorsement blurb for the cover, but it's on regulated industries. Wanted to mention that. So I apologize for going over, over time, but I want, I saw a few questions I could do there quickly, Roger. Yes, so. that's good. Okay. So, uh, uh, Sir Mike, uh, uh, our volunteer, for 40, we want to take a picture with you at the breakout room. Can I? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So, so thank you, everybody else. I appreciate appreciate your time today. Yes. Uh, thank you, everyone. Okay, we'll see you next time.